years, he coined the term the feminization of poverty in 1978, which has since entered the mainstream of sociology and poverty studies nationally and internationally. Dr. Pierce earned her MSW and her joint PhD in social work and sociology from the University of Michigan. Um, and and uh, there with the dean, of, current dean of the school at the table, which is great. Um, we are giving this presidential award today for her body of research that has informed, shaped, and advanced the social work profession and challenged society. During her outstanding career, she's been a prolific author who has published in areas such as low-wage and part-time employment, unemployment insurance, homelessness, and welfare reform, with a focus in all of those areas on how these issues impact women. Dr. Pierce has also done research and been an expert witness in the areas of school and housing segregation, and has been awarded three Fulbright scholarships. Dr. Pierce has helped found and lead several coalitions, including the Women in Housing Task Force, the Women Work and Welfare Coalition, the Women in Job Training Coalition, the Ad Hoc Task Force on Housing Homeless Issues and Welfare Reform, and the Practitioners Panel on Welfare Reform. These organizations have produced detailed agendas with analyses and proposals to address the problems faced by women, especially low-income women, in welfare, employment, housing, and the labor market. Most recently, Dr. Pierce has been working on replacing the poverty line measure used in the United States to measure economic well-being. And, and this is not to be confused with what Dr. Hartman was talking about. She's been working on an index called the Economic Self-Sufficiency Standard. This new measure, which has been calculated for 37 states in the District of Columbia, takes into account real-life expenses like taxes, housing, and child care, is adjusted for the ages of children in the home, assumes that all adults in the home will be employed, and does not assume welfare benefits. The measure has been used to advocate for raising the minimum wage and as an outcome goal for programs preparing people for employment, including welfare to work programs. Today, we proudly recognize Dr. Diane Pierce as the recipient of the NASW Presidential Award for Leadership and Research. Please join me in congratulating her as she comes forward.
led to the second and most common understanding of the feminization of poverty, the disproportionate burden of poverty on women. Although only about one in five families are maintained by women alone, about one half of poor families are. But perhaps the most interesting is the third understanding of the feminization of poverty. This is harder to articulate, but I would describe it as a naming image of an experience. Uh, not just income poverty, but marginalization, inequality, discrimination. Naming has power, it's in power into individuals um, and communities. A common experience when I address an audience on this topic, or even just mention it, is that a woman will come up to me and say, that's me, that's my life, I am the feminization of poverty. Or as recently happened, I was chatting with a nurse practitioner while getting a checkup, she said, oh, the feminization of poverty. That's my sister, followed by many details of how the feminization of poverty happened to her. Naming also makes visible the invisible. And suddenly there are studies and reports as people begin to look at that phenomenon. And I've seen lots of that. Um, third, naming provides a key organizing tool. It's a way to galvanize action. The third meaning of the feminization of poverty meant it became a rallying cry for the economic justice and anti-poverty wing in the women's movement. It resulted in hearings in San Francisco in the early 1980s, which were packed with people, and where moving stories of poverty and eviction led anonymous audience members to pass up envelopes of cash to meet the rent of the people testifying. It was a major theme of the Fourth World Conference on, on Women in Beijing, with feminization of poverty being specifically mentioned and poverty of women being a focus throughout the platform for action and the subsequent every five years uh, conferences and the women's commission. It became a powerful tool spurring action and organizing across the world. Not that it hasn't had its naysayers and detractors and many interpretations far from the original meaning, but definitely it's had a life of its own. But over three, three decades later, the phrase has been expanded and enriched. To get to this new understanding, Feminization of Poverty 2.0 requires two things. Redefining both terms, that of feminization and of poverty, and reframing the feminization of poverty as a rights and gender equality issue. In the original formulation, feminization referred to the gender of the adult maintaining the household, a conceptualization that makes sense in the U.S. and Western nations. But when taken to the developing world, it makes less sense. For the low mother households are increasing, most women in poverty in the rest of the world are not maintaining households alone, but are in marriages or family contexts other than nuclear families. And unlike the U.S., in many countries, women maintain households are not disproportionately poor. So I found when I was invited to Chile for an international group of parliamentarians, and a number of people in Latin America pointed out that in fact, if you look at those, they're different for different reasons. Yet as Beijing described it, there is much poverty within households, a burden borne by women. Sylvia Champ refers to this as the feminization of obligation, of globalization pulling men out of the household into more modern spheres and, more, and often into migration to the cities or even abroad, but in the end sharing even less of the work of reproduction, household maintenance, and subsistence farming. It ends up reinforcing gender roles that perpetuate poverty. And some kinds of the feminization of poverty, such as early marriages, are completely missed by an exclusive focus on household composition. At the same time, the formal marital status often does not reflect the realities of families torn apart by migration, internal and external, temporary and indefinite. Sometimes this leaves women who are left behind impoverished as remittances are sporadic and decline over time, and they are deserted by their spouses. In the U.S., such desertion was called grass widows during the Great Depression. That is, the husbands disappeared into the grass. <laughs> These women are still married, but as de facto single mothers maintaining households, they are often impoverished. Not only are women left behind, today half the migrants are women, leaving their children to relatives or even orphanages, while they become the nannies, nurses, and sometimes victims of traffickers in the Western world, to counter the poverty and inequality experienced globally by too many households. So feminization needs to encompass the ways that women are burdened by poverty, not just as household heads. The meaning of poverty, too, has come under question. In the United States, what we mean by the word poverty and what we measure have become increasingly divorced from each other. In a nutshell, the poverty line relative to the income distribution overall has fallen steadily and began
commanded about half of median income, and now is below 30% of median income. Thus has become, even in the words of Census Bureau statisticians, more a measure of deprivation than what people mean by poverty. The new supplement of poverty measure that we heard about from Heidi this morning improves things by more accurately counting resources. But the thresholds remain at roughly the same too low level. This has led me to develop an alternative, a measure that takes into account all of the costs of living, not just food and shelter, but health and child care, um, transportation and other work expenses. I will not digress to discuss this measure, the self-sufficiency standard, but to say that I believe that such measures are key to addressing the real poverty women face, and then including the full cost of child care, and all that that means, makes poverty measurement a feminist issue. Um, if you're interested in it, you can go to www.selfsufficiencystandard.org. Um, also, if you're interested in kind of looking at what the, how that varies, uh, Washington State has a, an online calculator. A number of other places do, but the Washington State one's easiest to remember. Thecalculator.org, and it'll tell you what the self-sufficiency standard is for a certain you know, family of certain composition in a certain place. Also tells you what benefits you qualify for. This is one of the new kinds of financial tools that financial social workers can use um, to help people access some of the social welfare benefits I was talking about. The rest of the world, however, is way ahead of us in terms of understanding the meaning of poverty. Not only does Europe generally use a relative income measure, usually about 50% of median income where we used to measure it, but the understanding of poverty is much broader and more nuanced than ours and includes the lack of capabilities, which we heard about um, this morning from uh, Jean, such as education, that enable achieving better income, health, etc., and the lack of functionings, the ability to use uh, one's capabilities. The lack of health, such as infant and maternal mortality, nutrition, a healthy life free of violence. The lack of a voice in formal politics as well as within the household and community to influence policy and programs. This is also considered poverty. The doing of uncounted work, work that remains invisible in GDP accounts as well as policy, such as the reproductive work of maintaining households, raising children, caring for the elderly disabled, and creating and maintaining community. All of these things are included. The effort to understand the broad poverty in these broader ways has led to more comprehensive measures such as the Human Poverty Index and gender-specific indices such as the Gender-Related Development Index and the Gender Empowerment Index which include things like voice and health and uh, capabilities. So rather than asking worldwide how many people are living below a dollar a day or two dollars a day, these indices with multiple indicators are used. The result of the understanding, goal setting, and program development in anti-poverty work is much broader than is measured by narrow income and economic measures. Using this richer understanding of both feminization and poverty, however, is just the first step towards uh, feminization of poverty 2.0. Equally important is the second step, that of reframing the feminization of poverty through the lens of human rights. Taking the dictum articulated by Hillary Clinton that women's rights are human rights and applying it to poverty. I assume few in this audience would disagree with the assertion that women, as well as men, have the right to the things enumerated, enumerated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, to employment at a fair wage, to a healthy life free of disease and violence, and, and so forth. But a human rights perspective is more than this, for it reframes the issue of women's poverty. If we take welfare, for example, instead of engaging in what Barbara Nelson calls a needs discourse, taking a human rights perspective reframes the issue in several key ways. The focus becomes on the perpetrator of the denial of rights, the person or system that has violated their rights, such as the rights to safe motherhood, to a decent income, to help. Instead of blaming the victim and focusing on the behavior, the morality, the dress, etc., of poor women, and trying to change their behavior, like getting them married, <laughs> thus privatizing the problem. Instead, the focus shifts when you use a human rights perspective to the structural cost, the system, or person, laws or practices or policies, not the poor themselves. Just as we have shifted the burden of proof from the rape or domestic violence survivor in her behavior, her dress, etc., to the perpetrator of the violence, both the individual and the largest of society that condones the violence or perpetrates the violence, so we must shift our focus 
in anti-poverty work to build systems and persons that perpetuate poverty. It asserts that the is universal for all people and not contingent on budgets, political will, power across all groups and societies. Third, it evaluates the success of anti-poverty uh, uh, efforts in an egalitarian framework rather than use a special, very low criteria for success. To cross the federal poverty lane, for example, does not by any understanding get one out of poverty. And yet welfare reform is touted as a success because women earn wages that put them above this limited and very low threshold. Is that a right from an asset right framework as if a given program or policy gets women lives free of poverty as we understand it. That is, they're healthy, they have voice, they have choice, they have opportunity for education, for uh, earning a decent wage, etc. That the broader meaning of poverty described above. One way to think of this is that broadening the understanding of poverty in this way links gender inequality and gendered poverty much more power powerfully than either alone. Just as development efforts move from with women in development, focusing on women and what women need and what, what, what characteristics of women, to gender and development, resulting in analyses of gender relations and the impact of programs, so much efforts to counter the feminization of poverty make a similar transformation and look more at gender relations and, and um, overall um, uh, programs and overall economic uh, Note that this reformulation of the feminization of poverty changes the basic and specific, doesn't change the basic and specific nature of women's poverty. That is, although women can be poor for some of the same reasons men are poor, lack of education, for example, women have two distinct causes that underlie the feminization of poverty. And we heard about this from Heidi. They bear the predominant economic as well as emotional burden of raising children as single mothers or in some contexts as the parent responsible for the uh, children's well-being. And they experience a labor market that discriminates against women, not only the wage gap, but also occupational sex segregation, discrimination in hiring and promotion, part-time status, gender and sexual harassment, all with economic consequences. And when the institutions of marriage and the market fail, a third factor may come into play, and that is the way public programs, policies, and supports either alleviate or exasperate the poverty created by the failure of either the marriage or market institutions. In some European countries, for example, with just as unequal labor markets for women, single mother families are not poorer than um, two-parent families or uh, male-headed uh, families because government supports make up the difference. In the U.S., on every score, as a recent legal momentum report documented, single mothers are worse off. Using this enhanced understanding of feminization and poverty, and using a rights perspective, how does this change the focus of our efforts to counter the feminization of poverty? I would suggest a few things on an agenda that would include the following elements. And this is not meant to be comprehensive, but these are a few of the things that derive, I think, from this new uh, perspective. First, explicitly address gender and gender relations in anti-poverty programs. We have never had a welfare reform or war on poverty that explicitly takes into account gender or race for that matter. It is outrageous that programs that should lift us and women out of poverty actually end up reinforcing them. What if we took into account that women graduating from the same training programs are getting the same college degrees, getting the same jobs, are paid less? What if we held government programs accountable for placing women out of training programs into jobs and they end up getting lower wages? What if we explicitly address sexual and gender harassment, especially in non-traditional jobs? What if instead of focusing on the behavior and characteristics of women in poverty, we focus on the structures of the labor market, of child support enforcement, of divorce uh, laws that result in impoverishing single mothers, no matter what their attitudes or characteristics? Second, include a gender impact statement in budget analyses, akin to environmental impact statements. Uh, third, cha challenge wage gaps, which research uh, I did recently showed that the wage gaps are worse at the lower uh, levels. And I'd love to hear what Heidi's data shows, but the, this work that I did in one, in, in one state, they have published it, so I can't name the state, um, found that uh, people had 
professional levels, there was less of a gender wage gap. But when you get down to the lower levels, things like retail workers, uh, that there is a bigger wage gap, especially in the expanding service sector occupations. It's very depressing. Because those are the lowest wage already, and women get lower wages than, than men in those uh, wages, in those areas. Uh, for, focus on single mothers and single fathers separately in every port. My analysis showed, always shows substantial differences, and using phrases such as single parent blurs and hides the situation faced, faced by women and their families. It degenderizes it. It makes it more difficult for people to understand um, for, for people to understand that there's something about being a woman maintaining a family alone that's going to make you poor. You're going to get less wages, etc. If you do single parents, you miss that. And we, we all do that. Um, but I think if we focus it more, that's going to bring gender more to the fore. Uh, fifth, a major source of women's poverty worldwide is the burden women bear of raising and supporting children, whether alone or as their specific obligation. Yet we approach labor market issues as if women were not mothers. The Family and Medical Leave Act is, is one exception. As President Clinton said recently on the, 20th, uh, on the 20th anniversary, when we force people to choose between being successful workers and successful parents, the country loses. Instead of using parenthood as an excuse to not promote or invest in women workers, make work supportive of parenting. This is a fundamental but essential challenge to how we do business in all of our uh, institutions and throughout the labor market. And we really need to work on how, that, how we can make it. We've got pieces of it, but we need to work on that more. Six, make the family or household the focus and unit of measurement, not the individual. Doing so forces a focus on the adult responsible for the economic fortunes of the family and whether the adult is a woman, man, couple, or other. In the process, it deflects from the tendency to focus on poor children. I have nothing against kids. I have plenty of them. <laughs> but focusing on children implicitly sets up a dichotomy of innocent children victims versus... Um, that is, if the kids are innocent, then the parents, read mothers, must be guilty. This deflects from focusing on why the mothers are poor, when we should, as described above, examine what mothers disproportion and poverty what causes mothers to disproportionate poverty? Even Nicholas Kristof, co-author of Half the Sky, especially when he writes about the United States, tends to write off parents. They have made bad choices, nothing said about the choices available, and focuses on the next generation. Finally, the training social workers get around poverty too often neglects the role of gender. We as social work educators here tend to focus on gender as a source of identity, and may mention it in passing as a source of oppression. But too little time is spent on understanding poverty as a gendered phenomenon and gender relations as oppressive, with all the ramifications of that for clients' lives. Part of this lack is the individual focus of much of social work, despite the social in our names. Sometimes I do an exercise with students asking them first to think of someone in their family or friend who is poor and to write down the two or three factors that led to that poverty, such as divorce, she married a jerk, um, <laughs> get a child outside of marriage. Then they ask them to ask, not usually the same day, to list the two or three major factors causing poverty in society at large. And they talk about unemployment, low wages, poor health, lack of education, language barriers. But they are smart enough to know the right answers, for the, especially for the second question. But when it comes to clients, how often do they really apply that macro and really think, think about um, what they are, uh, uh, think about the fact that the, the client is in, embedded in an environment and a society that is creating that poverty. And it isn't always the individual characteristics and causes like divorce. I would like to finish uh, with a quote from the original article, which I think kind of makes us think about what's changed and what's not changed. Welfare's role in women's poverty is much more than one of pen and pen and payment levels, for it plays an important role in perpetuating women's poverty. The welfare system has not only bureaucratized poverty, it has institutionalized it. By uniting inequality in the labor market with the pauperization endemic to public welfare, it oppresses all women as well as those already in poverty. The major implication of both the feminization of poverty and the increasing labor force participation of welfare mothers is that gender cannot be ignored. That is, the poverty of women have men and the poverty of women are different problems requiring different solutions. 
without such, and skipping a bit, without such changes, we will continue to build a, what I call a workhouse without walls, and its inhabitants will become even more predominantly women, who are trapped in a life of poverty by welfare penuriousness.